With his troops poised to attack through the Belgian border, Hitler was now confronted with the appalling possibility that his battle plan had fallen into Allied hands. But he could not be sure. He stood down 60 divisions to await intelligence reports. He did not have to wait long. According to the German archives, on the 19th of February, Hitler received this cable from Zeck Berkesroder. The Duke of Windsor has said that the Allied War Council devoted an exhaustive discussion at its last meeting to the situation that would arise if Germany invaded Belgium. Reference was made throughout to a German invasion plan said to have been found in an aeroplane that made a forced landing in Belgium. Astonishingly, the cable went on to spell out the proposed response of the Allies to a German advance through Belgium. This was exactly what Hitler needed to know. Armed with confirmation that his plan had been compromised, Hitler could now be confident that a radically changed plan of attack would succeed. He directed his infantry and tank regiments to attack down these roads through the Ardennes forest, which the Allies had assumed were impassable. This border post was all that stood in their way. Defended by a token force, the German tanks swept all resistance aside. They poured out of the forest and thrust northward in a pincer movement to surprise the British and French forces at Sedan. The evidence offered by the German foreign policy document seems indisputable. Edward had jeopardized his country and the Allies. The German records make it very clear that the Duke was the source of the information. If it was witting, he was a spy and a traitor. If it was unwitting, then at the very least he was careless. And somebody in his position should have known better. The German army stormed through northern France and into Paris in just 35 days. Despite holding military office, Edward reacted to news of the invasion by leaving Paris for his holiday villa in the south of France. For any other serving officer, this would have been a court-martial offence. We don't know whether he had any orders. On the face of it, he should have rejoined his unit, he should have gone back to Britain when the, with, with the rest of the liaison officers when they withdrawn. What he did instead was to correct his wife dramatically and romantically and buzz off to the south of France and then via there into Spain and in Portugal. And I cannot help feeling that anybody else would have been, this would have been regarded as desertion uh, in the face of the enemy. I think he simply, as in everything else he did, put himself and his wife ahead of his country and his loyalties and his family, uh, the rest of his family and his brother, the king, and so on. Melancholy fate for the naval might of France. And so it proves. The complete collapse of France follows swiftly. City after city is abandoned without resistance to become a hell on earth. At the outbreak of World War II, Edward was given a military post in Paris. But when German troops invaded northern France in 1940, he turned and ran, firstly to his villa in the south of France and then to Madrid. On the 21st of June, the French signed their armistice agreement with the Germans. Most British people uh, were heading for Bordeaux, the Atlantic ports in the Bay of Biscay, which was Vichy France in an attempt to escape where the ships were coming to take them off. What does Windsor do? He heads for Madrid. Spain had, uh, was a potential ally of Hitler's. It was a hotbed of intrigue. And it's astonishing to me that somebody in Windsor's position would decide to go to Spain rather than to head across France, the five-hour drive, to join the rest of the British evacuees at Bordeaux. In the year 
Tower has achieved a military miracle, the evacuation of Dunkirk. Boatload after boatload embarked on the ceaseless attack. While Britain lived through the darkest days of the war and evacuated her troops from northern France, the Duke and Duchess installed themselves here, in suite 501 of the Ritz Hotel in Madrid. They were warmly welcomed by Franco and his government. Spain was supposedly neutral at this time, but in reality, Franco's regime was firmly in the Nazi camp. Spanish society felt, no doubt, felt the same way about Germany as he did. And I think that he felt he was safe there. And very possibly, he felt that perhaps he might be able to influence the course of the war, or the course of the peace, rather, by keeping in touch with the Germans. Over the next two months, there was an extraordinary struggle between Hitler and Churchill for the Duke's loyalties. The Nazis were desperate to keep him in Spain so they could negotiate with him directly. Churchill insisted that the couple return to Britain. To buy time, Edward made demands he knew were unacceptable to Churchill. He insisted that his wife be accorded the title of Her Royal Highness. The Duke of Windsor was occupying Churchill's time by ask, the making demands, again, about the question of the HRH for the Duchess, and ridiculous details like, could he take his um, soldier servant with him um, and excuse him from military duty, which is, again, a pretty shocking thing at that time in the war. And it's unbelievable that Churchill should have to occupy himself with such triviality at a moment like that. Churchill had his hands full. There was a small and potentially dangerous pro-peace movement in England, which was lobbying for negotiations with Hitler. Churchill was determined that the Duke would not become a figurehead for this group. Edward was still convinced that appeasing Hitler was the answer and that the war was a mistake. The Windsors had shown they were prepared to speak out against the British. An extraordinary account of their behavior is recorded by the American ambassador in Madrid, Alexander Weddell. It's Weddell who actually says that there is, quote, an element in England, possibly a growing one, who would find Windsor and his circle a group who are realistic in world politics and who hope to come into their own in time of peace. Now, the language, the realistic, the, is the same language that the Foreign Secretary was using in responding to the initial peace feelers. It, it's the same language, and it's suggesting that Windsor is becoming the focus of the peace uh, process, that Hitler is trying to ram down England's throat. Hitler was not going to risk losing Edward. He ordered his ambassador in Madrid Eberhard von Stürer to keep Edward in Spain and under German control at all costs. Von Stürer reported back to Hitler that Edward would only return to Britain under certain conditions. If his wife were recognized as a member of the royal family, and if he were appointed to a military or civilian position of influence. Windsor has expressed himself to the foreign minister in strong terms against Churchill and against this war. In Berlin, Joachim von Ribbentrop, the foreign secretary, advised Hitler to co-opt the man they saw as a friend of Nazi Germany. Documents from the time prove that the dictator planned to reward Edward's loyalty by reinstating him on the British throne when Germany won the war. Ribbentrop was even prepared to offer Edward 50 million Swiss francs to lead a life suitable for a king. King George VI and Churchill were painfully aware of the threat Edward represented. They were receiving regular bulletins from Madrid through their secret service. It has recently been revealed that Alec Harding, the king's private secretary, wrote a secret memorandum to his master based on intelligence reports from Spain. <laughs> 